Hi there, everybody, and welcome. James Halliwell here of the Lex Van Damme Training Academy. Very pleased that you can join me um, for what will be, hopefully, a very useful and interesting uh, 10 minutes or so, where we will be going through the first offering of our trading club service, which is the weekly market report, uh, which is basically updated and produced uh, for you every Monday and features many of the key data and also some of the proprietary scorecards that uh, Lex and I have developed here at the Academy and Lex himself uses also as his fund. So I hope this will be uh, interesting. If you bear with me, um, as you can see, I'm actually on the, uh, the member area of our website currently. So if I head into the trading club, and click into the uh, the menu here. What we're going to be looking at is the weekly market report, which is just one of the components that you can see here. So I have already uh, downloaded it for attention. So let me uh, make this a little bit easier to see on the screen. And we will go through uh, how you can use this to generate ideas in your own trading um, before later in the series, we'll also look at the checklist process, which incorporates many of these data. So first of all, on the front sheet, we have uh, a summary of the really important monthly economic data at the top, which incorporates things like purchasing managers' indices uh, for, uh, for Germany, other parts of Southern Europe, uh, in the case of Italy, uh, and also China and the US. Uh, we also have some consumer data in there in the form of retail sales and the housing market in building permits, which is linked closely to the consumer. Uh, as a gauge of uh, the, the, uh, the public's uh, health, as it were. And then also we have uh, container activity on there with the inbound, outbound container shipments. Now, what we're looking to do here and what we're looking to present is a snapshot of how these, uh, these data are faring. So you'll see at the bottom we provide a score. So that's just a, a sum of the, uh, the one month change in this case. So we see here, we have one, two, three, four positives, two negatives, so four, four data improving, two data deteriorating, and that's what gives us the score at the bottom of plus two. To the right hand side, you've got more information including the 52 week range, which is interesting to note. You can see uh, at the time of recording this, many of the data are at the 52 week extreme high. Um, which bodes very well as uh, leading indicators of uh, economic activity. Um, and you can also uh, keep abreast of when the uh, next release will take place, when, of course, we'll also update the, uh, the sheet for you on the subsequent Monday. So elsewhere, we also look at some short-term economic data, so not just monthly. We look at things that uh, more often than not are market-based or are um, published on a, a daily basis or weekly basis in some cases. And again, we've got a basket there, which we'll be summarizing a little bit later in the course. Um, but looking at this, you can very easily see on the week that uh, things have improved slightly um, compared to the, uh, the previous Monday. So we see a positive score for the monthly data, a positive score for the shorter term indicators. And then when we look at the other scorecards now, we can see just more green. So in fact, everything is positive on this front sheet. So I know, and I'm better informed, going into the trading week ahead, with this on my desk first thing on a Monday, I know that as a bias, things have improved across the board. And it's quite rare to see all four of these uh, scorecards um, the exact same color. It will normally be mixed. That's just the nature of, of markets. However, this is, uh, yeah, this is really gets my attention when, uh, when I see something like this, but it's quite rare. So what exactly do we have down here? We've gone through the first two. Well, we have a basket of leading indicators, which um, are similar in nature to the shorter term and monthly economic data, but are more uh, specific and finely attuned to what we feel is, is closely correlated in our experience to, uh, to risk markets and to um, the various asset classes that you can, one can trade. Um, so what we see here, again, these are the ones that we like to track. We've got sector ratios in there, for example, industrials versus staples, relative performance. Semiconductors, we look at financials. We also look at emerging markets as a, an equity complex. Things like Spanish CDS, so the credit default swap market for insuring against default of uh, government bonds, the Spanish government. Uh, and then we've got some commodities in there, including crude oil and, uh, and the industrial metals, iron ore and copper. So again... If these are ticking up, things generally bode well. 
positive score at the bottom uh, means that there's improvement overall. Now sentiment indicators we view from a contrarian perspective and we'll be explaining this later in the video series. Um, but essentially again you can see overwhelmingly more green here which suggests that generally people are becoming more or have become more pessimistic over the past week whilst despite the fact that um, the shorter term data and the leading indicators and any of these that have hit the wire uh, in the, uh, the meantime due to the dates that they might land on different dates um, yeah, they, they, they've been becoming more pessimistic as the fundamentals have been improving. So this suggests to me that there might be a buying opportunity uh, in the week ahead. So to look for those uh, if possible. So then what else do we have? Going on to the, uh, the next sheet, you can see an awful lot of charts. And if you like colors like I do, uh, colorful charts, it looks fantastic. It's like a kid in a sweet shop as the saying goes. Um, but essentially each of these correspond and are color coordinated to correspond with the sections that we saw on the front sheet. So in green, as you can see at the top, monthly economic data, you can see in green here the corresponding charts. So it makes it really actually quite easy to, um, to spot what you're looking for, for quick reference. And as I say, Lex and I always have a copy of this on our desks. Um, and it was really um, my idea to, uh, to make this available to you guys as well through the Trading Club once I saw the power of it um, put into, uh, into play on a week by week basis. So we have various measures on here, which we've gone through in the uh, on the front sheet. But visualizing the trend and knowing the uh, relative position where we've come from uh, is is really really important. Um, so there's lots of charts on here. There's a few that are really jumping out at me. Um, for example, the economic surprise for the U.S. That's quite an interesting one. Very sharp. Uh, retracement there in the uh, the lower left there's all sorts on here volatility of course being absolutely on the floor still also very interesting copper uh, stands out industrials versus staples that was very healthy emerging markets are clearly um, outperforming and that's being sustained as are semiconductors so tech stocks in the US so we can begin to see the real drivers of the market um, commitment to traders so US uh, S&P 500 futures traders are pretty bullish um, and have remained that way uh, barring a blip in sort of late 2016. So there's lots of information here. The consumer is confident. There's not too much uh, wobbling there. That's a clear trend. So that bodes well for the US. Look at jobless claims down there. You know, there's, uh, there's been some volatility in that number, certainly. Baltic Dry Index is a proxy of commodities. So commodities may be kind of, uh, this is the raw industrial metals, maybe likes of iron ore and so on. They appear to be sort of rounding, but uh, you know, freight demand, as measured by the Baltic Dry Index, is still ripping. It's at uh, recent highs, so um, there's lots of interesting stuff which you can derive from this. You can basically see the Spanish elections and the Catalan uh, at the time of recording. There's the Catalan dispute priced in here. Um, there's all sorts of things to be um, to be seen in the charts. But without further ado, I don't want to make this an absolute uh, lecture. Allow me to uh, to swiftly move on to the next pages, and we've got the two pages laid out side by side here, um, just so we can we can keep the video a little bit shorter, or at least try to do so. Now we then move on to asset classes. So to begin with equities, and we have an overview of the various um, global indices that we um, that we follow. You've got the best part of I'd say twenty or so here, um, everything from emerging markets to the uh, various uh, developed market indices and again it's good to visualize um, what's leading what's lagging on the month you can also then see the year-to-date performance at a glance so uh, emerging markets have been the clear winners uh, so far year-to-date and then you can picture the the 52 week range which is just absolutely incredible um, when we see there's only really Russia and Spain who aren't Russia Spain and um, Whoever we have there, you may have to forgive me as I'm not actually sure <laughs> off the top of my head which one that is. We've got so many of them. Um, they may have changed the, uh, the naming methodology. Anyway, um, you, to see all of them here, all global markets at basically 52-week highs, um, it tells you something. It's, it's a very strong, um, almost frenzied bull market. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's also a reason to be cautious, I guess, as well. So anyway, um, moving on to the right-hand side, we know the technical information, we know the performance, but we want to understand the fundamentals at a glance as well. So within this, it's all well and good having everything at a 52-week high, it, so everything's performing really well. But within this, you know, which ones are 
the relatively cheap markets and which ones are the relatively expensive markets. So at 52 week high, I'd far rather own a relatively cheap market than be buying something which is at a record um, multiple also or is at, is at an extreme valuation. Um, so that, that's where this information becomes even more useful after you've seen this. And you can begin to spot outliers as um, I have prepared in, uh, in a few slides from an example a few months ago. So let's just have a quick look at that before we go any further through the report. So these examples were taken from earlier in the year. In this case, it was around uh, May. It was the beginning of May 2017. Uh, when we did a, a presentation elsewhere for our club members and I retrieved these slides because these were some of the call outs at the time um, so hopefully it'll demonstrate how you can use the, the sheet for idea generation. Now to begin with this example is actually of the sector grid which we haven't yet uh, looked at on the, the weekly sheet um, but it's very similar it's basically the same um, information just applied to sectors that we've seen for the global indices and what we were calling out at the time was the, uh, the valuation uh, disparity, the difference between healthcare, which looked relatively cheap across the board on a uh, forward price to earnings, forward price to sales and price to book uh, valuation versus consumer staples. So if we we're thinking of a potential uh, spread trade, long short sector trade, then as we saw here and we recommended at the time, our idea was to look to buy the healthcare ETF XLV and sell the, consu the consumer staples ETF XLP. So this is what the chart looked, at, looked like at the time. And then subsequently when I've updated this um, for this video, I noted the change here. And this, you know, this spread really ripped higher. It, it changed over 13%, which for two large cap uh, major S&P 500 super sectors as are known, is, uh, is, is quite a move over, say, six months or so. So the moves won't always be as, as great as that. However, another one that we identified at the time, and this time focusing in on the, uh, the index performance that we, we noted on the weekly sheet a, a moment ago, look at the uh, relative performance and especially the relative valuation of um, the American stock market, so the S&P 500 versus the rest of the world. Um, the performance was similar at the time, and each were basically at the 52-week high. However, if you think, do I want to concentrate my investments in U.S. stocks alone, or do I want the diversification of global equities, given the cheaper valuation? On a, on a price-to-earnings basis, it's you know around one full point cheaper, not massive. But on price-to-sales basis, it looks around 25% cheaper, which is quite important. It's quite a low multiple. And on a price to book measure, it's uh, you know it's the best part of a third uh, cheaper. So if you're considering a market neutral position, if you wanted to trade the U.S. versus the rest of the world, the idea that we generated here from the sheet, which is the reason why I'm, I'm sharing this with you, is to demonstrate how you can apply the information in that weekly report uh, yourself. You're quite capable of doing this yourself with that information over time. We look to uh, sell the S&P, so sell the U.S. versus the rest of the world. So this was the chart at the time. And then fast forwarding to today, so around six months, um, you can see that the, the US has underperformed the rest of the world. So the ratio has fallen, as we suggested, selling the ratio uh, by almost 6% and a little bit more than that during the period. So another one on here, if you want to be a little bit more specific, rather than just saying against the rest of the world, emerging markets with a screaming uh, long trade um, to, to play against the, uh, the short S&P 500 leg. And looking down to the bottom on the month, uh, they had seriously lagged the, uh, the US uh, equity index. And on the year, they were outperforming. So it looked as though that month there'd been some uh, capitulation, some selling, uh, when in fact they, there was clear leadership year to date at this point in time. So this looked like an opportunity for us. And it was clear from the valuation that um, if, if you would rather at 52-week high own a rich market or a cheap market, I would always take the cheap one. So it's 11 times earnings versus 16, one point, uh, basically one price to sales versus 1.0 or two, um, and half the, uh, the price to book measure for, for emerging market equities. It appeared like a no-brainer. So here's what the chart looks at at the time. And then if we fast forward, um, you can see that emerging markets have outperformed the 
ever rising and still rising S&P 500 by 11.5% regardless. So let's get back to the weekly report as we were. Um, so the other things you have on here, at a glance, really useful for reference. You have um, an overview of the various equity styles. So for example, how value is performing relative to growth. As you can see, with the exception of the reflation rally in 2016, going into early 2007, uh, 2016, uh, before the sell-off or the reversion again in 2017, you can see that value has been underperforming growth very clearly now. If it begins to bottom and it turns up, then I think uh, investors need to begin looking at value names versus growth. But as a style, again, that's something that we have we have traded ourselves over the last few years. And uh, it, it's good to have at your fingertips because it can be quite difficult to compile these indices. Or if you have to rely on ETFs, you can sometimes be thrown out by the various weightings, etc., by the uh, and methodologies from the provider. Elsewhere, you've got cyclicals versus defensives. That's also useful to know. You can see basically since Trump has been elected, we've seen the rally in the likes of industrials uh, versus staples, um, cyclicals versus defensives. That's looking pretty uh, pretty bullish at the moment, um, but interesting to uh, to monitor. And developed versus emerging markets, you can see that as this trends down, emerging markets are in fact outperforming uh, developed markets, which is one of the ideas again that we looked at uh, generated from the sheet a moment ago. And then large versus small cap. So small cap still uh, are leading globally the uh, the large cap counterparts. So then quick snapshot of the uh, the various major global indices from the US to Germany to uh, Europe broadly and uh, and also Japan with the Nikkei. Um, what I see here is, okay, I think everybody knows what the S&P 500 is doing. If you look at the DAX, it's also broken out. Europe as a whole is yet to break out, so that appears to be the laggard and would be somewhere that I would look to potentially play uh, as, as, as a catch-up against perhaps Germany or against perhaps the US. Um, and the Nikkei also looks good, and that's quite a, a clean breakout here. So from a momentum perspective, um, if we're looking to buy a breakout, the Nikkei looks pretty good. If we're looking to play reversion and play a catch-up on a relative basis, perhaps the Eurostox is interesting. And you have then the sector overview, which we saw um, in the uh, the example a few minutes ago. Um, we have this for the US, Europe, UK, and Japanese markets as well. So you've got the same information and lots of good stuff as we've demonstrated can be uh, derived from here on a weekly basis. So this should really help. So having done uh, that for equities, we then have a section for commodities. So this provides an overview of the major agricultural um, Commodities, also the metals, the industrial metals and precious metals included, um, and then the uh, the energies. So we're looking at Brent, natural gas and crude oil, um, WTI crude. So um, again, another useful thing like the equity stars to have, I think, is not just the performance of commodities as a, as a uh, complex or as an asset class, but also the sub-indices. So how we can see within this, it's been great to be in industrial metals, it hasn't been good to be in agricultural commodities whatsoever. Energy's kind of been, you know, in the middle of the two, but I'd far rather have been long industrial metals. So if I, as I saw this bottoming out, it was quite clear that industrial metals were within uh, commodities, the place to be focusing on. So I'd be spending more of my time looking at this um, middle box than the other two perhaps. So that's interesting. And the, the really valuable stuff on here is the way that we present, it's one of my favorites certainly, is the way that we present the CFTC, so the futures positioning data. And what we're looking for here is basically reversion at extremes. So um, we won't spend too much time going through it now, but basically um, I can see Palladium is at a 52-week long, extreme long. I can see uh, Brent is at a 52-week um, extreme long. In, in terms of a short position. Um, so that's quite interesting. Maybe we could see some reversion there. And with Palladium up so much on the year, over 40% and up more than 5% in the month, with the way people are positioned, everybody's very bullish. Um, so if there's any, any spark or catalyst for a sell-off, um, I think that's somewhere where you could find opportunity. So just at a glance, this is how you can come up with, uh, with ideas already. We've, we've got an idea in metals, we've got an idea in energy, and we've got two ideas, therefore, in commodities alone as we've been going through things. 
So now to look at uh, the right hand side of the screen to the next page, we have an overview for FX. And this gives you things, in addition to the performance, this give you, gives you things like the 10-year uh, 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 bond, government bond, so 10-year rate, which is pretty interesting to know. It also highlights the change on the week, which is in basis points, so one-tenth of one percent. You also have the inflation, latest inflation reading, and from that we can calculate, next to the central bank rate, we can calculate the, uh, the real rate. So as you can see, real interest rates for the major currencies, the G10, are all negative. That's making me think about gold as much as anything else. It's making me think, you know, being a saver in any of these countries uh, is, is, is not necessarily a good thing. And then you can view this by region as well. So we have uh, for Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe. We've got all sorts in there, uh, as you would expect, representing each of the, um, the major countries in that region. And then we also look at it um, and relate it to what we've seen already for commodities in the oil basket and the broader commodity basket. So some of the, the currencies which are closely linked to the performance of oil and some of the currencies which are closely linked to uh, commodities in general. And it was quite interesting to note as if commodities have performed really well on the month, for example, and you know the, these currencies are doing the opposite, then there might be opportunities to play uh, in there. And these are the kind of things which we'll be generating in our, in our club videos and have done uh, previously. So also, a um, quick snapshot of currency performance, including the volatility, the currency volatility indices for major currencies and emerging market currencies. You can see both of which have been falling recently, uh, notably in emerging market currencies, as, uh, as things have settled and there's been a rally there. Um, and then moving on to the right-hand side, we finish with some really important drivers of currency markets. Now, you'll become familiar with the, uh, the currency checklist process, uh, which we'll be applying to the dollar in, uh, in the example we'll go through in another video. Um, and we apply f also to the euro, yen, sterling, um, and a number of other currencies, including the Canadian dollar from, uh, from memory, in our uh, trading club meetings. But these are, these are great to get an overview of global PMIs. You know, really important, I can see they're improving on the, uh, on the month. So that looks good. It bodes well for those countries. Are there any outliers? You can begin to scrutinize the data and the ranges and spot which countries and therefore which currencies may um, perform differently. City macro index, absolutely great. Love this, particularly when I can see it for individual countries and not just the US as it's commonly reported or the Eurozone as we also, um, we also uh, emphasize in our club meetings. So again, this can help you uh, identify outliers. Norway, look at that move, for example, or the, the current level appears to be leveling out, um, so the momentum's kind of gone neutral, it's very negative, and these indices tend to revert. Is there a play to be had there in the Norwegian krona? And, and this, I assure you, is just as I glance down this, I haven't necessarily um, prepared these, uh, the, these comments uh, in advance. And then down at the bottom, we can begin to look at positioning, and immediately, um, you know, I want to see what the net position is first of all, for the dollar and how that's changed. So we can see that currently um, speculators are net short the US dollar against these currencies. It's the currency futures that we're tracking here, $16 billion. They were short last week, uh, the week before, um, $19 billion. So in fact, they've lengthened slightly. So they've taken off some of the short bets. Now, given that that was at an extreme, that's quite interesting. And that's obviously going to be a driver of commodities. It's going to be a driver of emerging market performance. It's a driver of pretty much everything, um, certainly gold also. So um, that's interesting. And that's before we even then begin to discriminate, if you like, between uh, different, uh, different nations within this. We look at the various ranges. The euro is extremely long. Um, but it's, it, the longs have been liquidated slightly on the week. So is this now has this now peaked has has optimism peaked in the euro now that's something to keep an eye on similarly for the canadian dollar pretty high and so on um japanese yen coming off the bottom a little bit um barely it's basically unchanged but it's a very negative position so you know are, are people wrong are people wrong thinking that uh, the yen's really going to depreciate um and, and they've been putting on those short bets and adding to them 
um, and all of a sudden now it looks as though they can't get much shorter. Are there any short sellers that really remain? I'm sure there are some, but uh, en masse, uh, are there enough to, uh, to keep the market moving in that direction? And with that, I appreciate there's a lot of information to, uh, to take in, but hopefully this has given you a flavour of what we can provide at the club um, in terms of the, the real insight and professional quality information that, that we look at ourselves. And uh, you can, of course, learn more and keep abreast of what's going on and how we're applying these in our trading club meetings. So I hope you join me for the next video. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining. Thank you.